Good morning, everyone. This is JoLynn Lutz from One Heart TV, and I have some special guests today that we're going to be talking about conflict and how to deal with that in this time of shutdown still and so forth in our communities. Sometimes it's just difficult when things have shifted or changed and we tend to lose our way in how to communicate with each other. So I really want to welcome my, my newest guest today. I've got Maria Seta and I have Cheryl Nickerson with me from Conflicts Solution Center, both in Santa Barbara and Santa Maria. Welcome to both of you. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to take people back uh, a little bit. First of all, uh, Cheryl, maybe you could explain what exactly Conflict, Conflict Solution Center is. Oh, that's a big question. We do a lot of things. So we started out in 1989 as a peace building grassroots organization. Um, over these years, we have added to our program. Uh, at this point, we provide um, very low cost mediation. Uh, we do private mediation as well as being the mediators for small claims court in Santa Barbara. We provide mediation training, um, both um, mediation to be mediator trainings as well as doing trainings in organizations. And we provide, which is our heart, restorative justice for juveniles, uh, primarily in Northern Santa Barbara County and restorative justice training and restorative justice outreach. Right, okay, fabulous. Mm -hmm. And you do the trainings both in Santa Barbara and Santa Maria? Yes, we generally split the trainings up um, between locations. Restorative justice training happens primarily in Santa Maria. Well, yes, I participated and had many of my one heart uh, board members uh, take the classes with you a few years back. Maria, does that take us back maybe? A few yes. years ago? If Might be did. where we met, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Well, we all work in the same circle, having uh, started a nonprofit called One Heart, doing anti-bully in the very beginning. It was to bring a dear and wonderful powerful group called Challenge Day to Santa Maria schools. And uh, when I had one of my board members, um, two board members actu actually using compassionate communication, that's what they called it. They realized that Challenge Day was using those particular uh, entities within their team building uh, shift. It, it's hard to explain unless you're in a challenge day workshop, but it was powerful. It makes complete shifts in the teens. And I was so taken by this that um, I had discovered through my board members that you guys existed this whole time, Cheryl and Maria, right here in my own backyard. So with that, I would love if you would uh, just tell me a bit about your stories and how you got involved. So Maria, would you like to start? Yes, definitely. Um, I used to work for Big Brothers Big Sisters for many years and Kimberly Rosa, um, she was the executive director at the time, you probably know Kimberly. Um, she had been a big sister. And when, all, when I had left Big Brother Big Sisters, Kimberly invited me to become uh, or be part of Conflict Solution Center. Um, I had taken the Compassionate Communication class with Kimberly, so, um, and I knew that I was doing mediation with the bigs and the little in the Big Brother Big Sisters program anyways. So, because that's what we do to keep those matches together. So um, I decided to come aboard and um, it has been a wonderful experience. Uh, it's very rewarding, and here, here I am. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. You're also a dear beloved alternative to violence. Uh, you've gone that, that route I saw as well, and so have high. It's, it's, it's just super yes. powerful, super powerful. I've done it in the prisons, 
And that's a whole nother subject, but uh, powerful. Um, Cheryl, how did you get started, please? Um, I got started kind of, kind of off the cuff. A friend of mine was um, a, one of the executive directors of the agency and she was just looking for someone to do office work for a few hours a week and I had a few hours a week. So I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, only to find out I was being groomed to become the executive director. It was quite a shock to me. So I did not have any background in um, dispute resolution, though I have kind of been in that role informally. My background is in banking hmm. and lending not the best match. And I have been or have been with Santa Barbara Rape Crisis Center, now Stessa, for many, many years, um, both as an advocate and on that board of directors. So just switching over agencies and it's been fun and frustrating and exhausting, but rewarding. And so I kind of think it's my match. It ended up being my match. Interesting. Banking and conflict. I would imagine there would be some conflicts in that one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, there's conflict in everything. Conflict is not a bad thing. Um, That's true. It's a natural thing. It's how you resolve the conflict. That. Let's get to that very word, resolving. Now, here's what I know when I took the classes, and please correct me, but as we grow as individual human beings in this planet, we don't always have the best communicating skills. I have found personally in my own life and uh, possibly just watching people in general. Um, I'm not sure if it's the difference between not listening to the other person really through the tools that I've learned or that we're not being heard. There's so many different levels to it, but we don't have uh, very good communicating skills. And yep. sometimes we have this one over another. It starts in schools when I did the anti-bully. You know, it's, it's this one child yelling and screaming at the other and neither one being heard. And of course that's a lose-lose and you use the, the verbiage win-win. Can you tell me what, what a win-win is uh, in your opinion with using the techniques you do? When you let's say when you go into court as one of the examples to help two people in conflict so it's it's win-win is an interesting choice because a lot of the reason that we cannot get out of conflict is due to competition mm. so we go into a dispute with wanting to be right Ooh, like, i'm great. right that's why i should prevail um but Dispute resolution doesn't necessarily depend on who's right. Um, the win-win is when both parties come out of it, understanding the perspective of the other, that they give some respect and credence to that, whether they accept it or not, they don't have to agree with it, but they understand, okay, I see you have a point. I see why you feel that way. Um, I don't feel that way, but I'm hearing what you're saying. And so when we can get both parties to that point, then we get closer to coming to a resolution that each of them, if not necessarily happy with or satisfied with. Like, okay, I can live with that. It's not what I came in wanting, but I can live with it. That's good. That's good. Um... A lot of times that's the truth. Uh, I have seen it where one comes in with a stance, you know, I, you know, I'm right and you need to give me this. And the other one saying, no, I'm right. I deserve this. Um, a lot of times I know as a mediator and being trained, it's boy, it really plays on your listening skills. You really need to be tuned in, don't you, to the individuals and what they're saying and then if possible, re have them rephrase, rephrase the question to the, per the party across the way. Is, is that some, something that I, as I recall? 
or you reframe it so that everybody hears it a little bit differently mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit more clearly because often when people are in the heat of a disagreement they don't explain what's really hurting their hearts Ooh, that's good you know that's because good. they're they're trying to protect themselves because you know when you're hurt you're vulnerable and a lot of that plays into an inability to resolve a dispute is the difficulty in being vulnerable with someone that you're having an argument with hmm. because that's when we become the most protective hmm. is when we're feeling attacked and we're feeling like you know no one's no one's listening to me and this happened to me and so their description of what's happening sometimes needs a little help and that's what we do as mediators is to question them and find out you know what are the underlying needs here that aren't being met what are you not saying and hopefully we can help rephrase that so everyone hears the same thing and everyone is heard right it does boil down to needs being met, doesn't it? Yes. 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 Um, I was going to say, can I say? Yeah, please. Um, so to be able to um, get them to that point too, we as mediators, you had mentioned earlier about empathy and we really have to listen with empathy. So listening is a very important skill mediators need to have. And um, not just listening, but also putting aside our own biases, our own, making sure that our own experiences won't come into play when we are dealing with this present situation, because that could easily happen. So okay, empathy Maria, is that, very important. That's a good point. Now, as a mediator, you have to disengage and just hear them how how do you do that if you if you were just giving advice to couples who are arguing at home obviously one or the other is not being heard a mediator is so wonderful to have but as someone like yourself in in court or working with teens or whatever or landlords um how how do you disengage how, what's a tool well obviously there is some uh self-care that we as mediators need to uh, do. Uh, and uh, so it's very important that we, we go to the uh, meeting center that we have uh, left anything that happens outside of court or outside our community mediation uh, meeting, just set that aside and, and make sure that we're centered when we come into that meeting. Yeah, yeah. I love a book that I reference a lot, The Four Agreements. Uh, what a wonderful book. And I think the one of the one of the hardest for me to still get is to not take things personally. Would you say both of you cannot take things personally with these two individuals you're working with? Definitely. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. And I guess and, and, and you know, I think the assumption from someone who's not doing would be that you're not taking it personally, things that are directed at you, but it, it means not, it, not taking on their conflict and resolving it with your own um, mechanisms that you would use to resolve it. So, you know, if I, someone says to me, don't take it personally. For me, it's not to get involved in someone else's argument and try and resolve it the way I would resolve it for myself. Because as we learn in our training, our mantra is it's not about you, yeah. it's about them. So whenever I get into a dispute with someone, that's the first thing that goes through my head is like, if someone's coming at me really aggressively, I say to myself, it's not about you. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's how they have learned to deal with their hurt and their disappointment. So their reaction to me is not about me. It's about them. And then it allows me to stay calm and stay focused 
because someone else's behavior is not about you, it's about them. And you need to contain and be able to express your own emotion and not react to someone else's. Right, right. Correct. You know, that's excellent point. I know when I was working with the teens at the juvenile hall, now these are the teens that were not behind the bars, but Mm -hmm. were on their way, so to speak. Um, They, um, it was about listening with them because a lot of them, from what I'd learned, have never been heard really from their family members. And it's so difficult. So we're giving, we we were trying to give them the first opportunity to just be heard, not judged. It it sounds a lot like what you're talking about, um, uh, disengaging from the emotional component of it. And um, that's a hard job though, as a mediator. I mean- It it really is. (laughs) I would think so. Because uh, I love Dr. Gabor Mate. I've been listening to him a lot about our traumas. And uh, a lot of us come up with traumas and then we get triggered. Would you, would you say that you see that a lot within the conflicts, things being triggered, you know? Well, absolutely, because mm-hmm. conflict itself is going to trigger. And we, it, it's something that you mentioned earlier is that we don't learn communication. We don't learn effective communication. We learn communication through our environment, through primarily through our family dynamic. And if that's ineffective, then we don't have tools. And they don't teach communication to kids in school. So they never learn what is effective or what is appropriate. And so communication be turns into responding rather than and reacting rather than kind of sitting down and being calm and being able to express yourself in a way that gets you what you want because what we learn is that you know we start to express ourselves in a way that guarantees that we won't get what we want because Mm -hmm. we're reactive and we are combative and you people think if they bully or you know if they're aggressive then they get what they want but they but that isn't what they want they just you know they have all these outside influences that tell them if you're the strongest if you're the toughest if you're Mm -hmm. the but that's how a lot of people survive in the world is that they have to put on that front Mm -hmm. in order to get through the life that they have but if you're dealing with someone who doesn't have that same kind of reaction, then you're never gonna get to a meeting point, which is why the communication um, becomes so important because it's a well, little, from my perspective, this is what would happen if I did what you think I should do. Right. And, you know, and it's a complete surprise to the person they're in a dispute with because they would never think of it that way. So it's, you know, Effective communication has so many components and trying to put them all together Mm -hmm. is a challenge, but it begins with just listening and just understanding how someone else walks through the world and how that impacts the position that they they have that is contributing to whatever um, conflict they're or dispute they're in. Right, right. Maria, do you have any thoughts to add with this? Um, no, not at this point. Okay, I have a question. Think of it as soon as we hang up. I know. Yeah. I have a question for you both because a lot of folks don't really understand uh, the concept of what you guys do. And I think um, I would love for you to both share a story, an outcome where you went in. If you can recall that uh, the folks can just hear a little bit of what you have done and walked through with some kind of, you don't give names, of course, of the people, but Maria, could you share a story that the outcome, it looked crazy at first, but it came out pretty good? Definitely. Um, I had a restorative justice mediation. It's a type of mediation, but it's with youth. And it's basically, they are referred mostly by probation. They could be referred by the school. I was, um, I used to, co-facilitate with Leonard Flippen, our beloved Leonard, and he passed away, of course. You you probably know him. 
he was very well known in the community. Mm -hmm. So this particular case, I was doing it by myself on a Saturday. It was with a teacher, a student, and the student's father. It was very tense because dad had gone through same experiences as a youth. And he was more hurt than anybody else. So the issue between the teacher and the student, it wasn't really that big of an issue, but because the police got involved, the police was contacted and that's how they end up in probation. The, the father was very, very upset. Um, it did help to let him know and listen, I know you're hurt. I know you're very scared for your son because you want your son to do well. And you were going through similar experiences. So you are afraid that there is some reputation that is affecting your sons, um, um, the, the way they perceive your son at school. And he hadn't shared that, but from talking to him, that's what I gathered as mediators. Um, I mean, as a mediator. So um, he said precisely. So he was very, he was very scared for his son. Uh, he was very upset. Um, he had been in gang. So his son did not belong to a gang, but the father had belonged to gangs and he has straightened out his life. So just help him dad see how hurt he was and release that hurt. It was enough for to see a shift in the uh, that face to face meeting. So it was very, um, it was a very positive outcome. There were no, um, it, normally when youth offenders, victims, the victim was a teacher and parents get involved, there is normally a, an agreement that they sign of something that the youth have to do. So basically, the, the youth, we are not there to decide that his behavior was good or bad. Basically, it is to see how his behavior affected other people. And um, there was no agreement because the teacher realized that it wasn't really such a big thing that happened. And I don't recall exactly what happened at the time, but it just, nothing came from that. And, um, and it was a positive, um, it was that we, when we get referrals from probation, we have to let them know if the meeting was successful or not. And that was a very successful meeting. Normally there is an agreement that they need to do something, but just that meeting right there took care of everything and and everything. And so the good the good thing about that is that the teacher, she did not even want to come to the meeting because she thought, well, it's all taken care of. It wasn't a big deal. I don't even understand why the police had to get involved. And, and uh, we encouraged her to come to the meeting because um, the youth, nevertheless, something had happened. And it was a good opportunity for him to learn that how his behavior had affected other people. So we meet as a community, the father was there. So in that particular case, we were all a community and he was able to see how his behavior, even though it didn't have consequences at that point, how it affected his father, how hurt his father was. They never had a conversation like that before and his father shared that, so. That was very, uh, very rewarding. That seems like definitely a, a heart, heart opening, heart opening moment. And that's, that's where I believe the healing, healing is. Wow. And so th they all, they all got to see this is what you're saying. The teacher as well, because she, she was included. So, wow. Yes. Oh, and the teacher, of course, what, she was part of that community. What a, what a gift. What a gift. Wow, thank you for sharing that story. That was beautiful. Um, Cheryl, do you have a... So I have two. Um, one is the only time I ever cried after 
um, a mediation and this was in court and one that had such an unexpected um, resolution just because there was such a shift in thinking. So the worst one was I had a case in small claims court where an older woman was suing what had been a friend um, for money for a trip. So the part of it that was so heartbreaking is that she was an older woman. She just lost her husband and she met this young man and they became friends. And through that, he was going on a European vacation. He invited her along. And then they kind of got into a little bit of a dispute about money, of course. And the money wasn't critical to either of them, but it was the, you know, but, the, but it's mine, but I should, or but this should happen. And, and their friendship fell apart after that. And she was, you know, she was in her late eighties, almost 90. She had no connection in her neighborhood, in her community. Um, this friend was her companion who took her out to dinner, went to shows. They had developed this great relationship and then she had no one over you know this money and it just just kind of broke my heart because in my personal life I was at the point where my father was aging and he didn't have a lot of connection out in the world and I know how important that would have been to him mm -hmm. to have that companionship mm -hmm. and then just be set adrift with no one Right. to help you to, you know, to be with you. So that was probably the hardest case I've ever mediated that they were not able to resolve it. Hopefully down the road they did and they're happily back together again. So that's what I'm hoping. And then just an unexpected one. We see a lot of landlord tenant disputes and we're seeing a lot of them right now. And we had a tenant who moved into a nice place and kind of remodeled it and did beautiful work on it. Um, designer stuff, painted it. But when they moved out, you know, they didn't return it the way they had rented it. And so the landlord, of course, sued them. Oh, I'm sorry, the landlord kept their deposit. And so they sued the landlord for the deposit. It was a $10,000 maximum lawsuit. It was a huge security deposit. And when they came out of it, they just said, okay, I understand the tenant, you know, finally said, oh, I get it. I know that it looks great and we were very happy with it, but we really understand your perspective that, you know, this is your home and that you want it to be a certain way and you're fine with us making some changes as long as we change it back. And they just completely dropped the whole thing in the mediation because they, finally step side of the outside of their own perspective of, but we made this house gorgeous to the landlord saying, but we didn't ask you to make the house gorgeous. We didn't want you to make the house gorgeous. That wasn't your choice to make. And they just dropped it and everybody walked out and everybody was happy and talking. And that's my favorite ending when the people who are in dispute leave together and they're laughing and they're talking and they're, oh, do you remember that so-and-so did this and they're, you know, like nothing ever happened. That's the best outcome of a mediation is when everybody's chatting, walking to their cars together. I know that feeling. I have personally used uh, Brian Walker, who was uh, one of my board members who, who, who helped me through uh, a crisis in my life. Um, and I'll tell you, sometimes there's so much energy uh, wrapped around the, the outcome of being mm. right. Yeah. And when that is somehow dropped, I don't know what it is because I do believe we're energy beings and we exchange energy with each other on a daily basis. That when that energy, that tight grip gets broken down, gets loosened, something happens. Something happens. It makes even the other side 
you know, their energy just goes, ah, oh, too. It's, it's, it's very fast. Right. Very fast. People, people will be butting heads in a mediation. And as soon as they come to an agreement, it all just goes, <sighs> and you can see how relieved and relaxed and, you know, they're, they're the tensest right before they agree to something. Right. That's when they have the most chance of walking away is because they feel like they're giving up their power Ooh, by admitting that they're not right. But as soon as they make that decision and make that choice, then they're, it's like they become different people. Mm-hmm. And right. that's what people don't understand going into it. It's like, but if you resolve this, you will feel so much better when it's over. Yeah. Because they, they, they're going to take they're going to take that back out into the community or take it back home. They're going to take that back home. And who's going to get the brunt of that? Oh, it's horrible, right? Yeah, I'm working on one right now that's just really frustrating because I cannot get, as as we're kind of outlining what could have gone wrong and why the other party's feeling the way they are. And, you know, the person I'm working with will well, I get that. Yeah, yeah, but we'll not shift. So the it, opinion it, or the outlook. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, he's still committed to the. But I'm, but I'm right. And it's like, well, maybe you're not, and maybe you are. But you need to recognize all these other things that happened that led you to where you are now. Do you kind of see why your the other party is feeling the way they do? And won't, won't even acknowledge it, won't even acknowledge what's being said right. because they're just so entrenched in their position. See it all the time. See and then it end up going to court the and then someone's unhappy when you could have both been. Well, a good example right know. now is the way that we've been separated in our country. And you've got people really stand standing on this side and standing on this side. And I am so in the middle watching this happen that it breaks. It is breaking my heart to watch this in so many ways, because Mm. I know they feel passionate about whatever it is that they're believing in. What's a belief system, something you tell yourself over and over until you believe it. So how to break that belief system just for a minute and surrender to the possibility, right? The possibility that maybe just surrender. Whew, it's a biggie. And also that you can hold on to that belief system, but that doesn't mean that you embrace everything. Exactly. That's a part of that, that, you know, you can take a half of it or three quarters of it or nine tenths of it, mm-hmm. but you don't have to take a hundred percent of it. If a hundred percent of it really does not align mm-hmm with what your true True. desires are or what your true emotions are about something. And I think we get into, along with that, right thing, this um, loyalty, because, you know, loyalty can really damage you when it's misplaced or Mm -hmm. it's not understood. And, you know, you can be loyal to something or someone and not take on everything that that person or that opinion has. Like you can pick and choose what you want to believe. You don't have to take the whole ball. True. We all have to survive. Maria, did you have some thoughts? You are definitely agreeing. (laughs) (laughs) Something came to mind when Cheryl was talking and is that what we hope as mediators is that, so mediation is highly successful. But even on the cases, the few cases where it does not happen, where they agree, mm-hmm. our hope is that there is a change in consciousness where at least the people that get out of mediation, they start seeing it a little different because what happens is we are at different stages in our, I would call it our spiritual life. And not everybody is at the same level so somebody may still be at this level and they may not get it now but maybe they live with some change in consciousness and eventually they may it may click and they may realize that oh yes so this happened here and wow 
so that was right. Maybe that is something I need to change. Oh yeah, well maybe my neighbor and I can start getting, getting along better. So it may not happen there at mediation, but it may happen later on. Kind of drop the seed. Yeah, drop the a, seed. Su a, su a successful mediation is a mediation. Just getting two people to the table together. That's Ooh. successful. <laughs> That's good. All right. This has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I, I so appreciate you guys taking your time out. Don't want to take too much more. Uh, but I do want to give the people an, an opportunity to find out how they can be get involved and especially get trained as I did. Uh, I've used it. Uh, I use those tools. I bring them out when possible. Uh, because I'll tell you, it's not always easy to use. I'm a reactor sometimes, you know, not proactive, but reactive. So, so it's, it's, it's a constant conscious effort to remind myself, but how can people get involved? I'm going to put your website, you know, in the bottom down for people to get a hold of you and phone numbers. And I explain that you have times that you're available and so forth by appointment, but What's the best best way that they can get involved? Would you would you recommend people to get just anybody to be trained? Does it take a special type of person? Uh, I think training benefits everyone. The first half of our training is caring and compassionate communication. That is the name of the training, and everyone benefits from learning effective communication techniques. Um, part of that is understanding your own um, communication triggers, um, how you communicate when you're stressed out, when you're relaxed. Um, because once you learn how you react to things, then you are able to anticipate what's going to happen when you get into a tense situation. Um, and also how to listen and how to listen empathetically. Um, so I would recommend that for any and everyone. The second half of the training is actually mediation training to learn to be a me uh, mediator, um, dispute resolution. And you know you can take that out of interest or if your intention or your interest is either in volunteering with us to be a mediator or you know, you're looking at a different career path and you need a place to start. We're a cheap place to start with a mediation training because as we know, trainings are quite costly, um, but we're low cost and you kind of get your feet wet and see if that's something that you want to do. We have a training, hopefully beginning this summer, we're trying to shift our model from in-person to trying to deliver 40 hours of training, you know, remotely. Well, we kind of think that an eight hour day in training is a long day to be on Zoom. So we're trying to figure out how we're going to do that in four hour sessions and not have it, you know, last for six months. Um, so, or if you are having a dispute with someone, you know, we offer very low cost mediation, community, uh, parent, child, parent, child communication is very difficult because of the inherent um, power imbalance. So, you know, it becomes a much more difficult and needs to be handled a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the best mm -hmm. way to get involved. Um, we are training for restorative justice, looking for restorative justice trainers. If you know any of your subscribers are interested in, in doing that, Maria will probably be taking on quite a bit of that as we get back into school now that schools are, are meeting in person. And she's kind of the one person show up in North County and everything that gets dumped on her, she handles with grace. So um, any help that I can get for her would be great. Maria, thank you. Thank you very Maria. much. Maria. Thank did you. you. Did you have something to add to that of sorts? Uh, do you have any? Uh, any trainings coming up as of right now? Uh, well, it will be the same training. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So okay. I will be coordinating in North County whoever with whoever is interested in participating. You know, I had had a plan uh, in place that I'd really had hoped uh, would have taken off in, in Santa Maria, my little hometown. And that is to have uh, teens uh, from their high school, a mixed group of teens being trained in the alternative uh, to violence project to violence. where they could go into schools to the feeder schools, you know, and so it's kind of a hand in glove and it's a free program and it certainly makes you feel good. And the activities are fun and engaging and serious at times, but thoughtful in training the brain. Uh, our babies need us so much right now because of, of, course, of yes. the crazy. So that's a good place. Do you, do you do alternative to violence uh, programs at all? Uh, not, that's not part of it. Not in this, uh, uh, in conflict solution center, but we use the same principle. So it's all the same. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. It's a very similar and the same. Gotcha. Very, gotcha. very similar. We, wow. we use the same compassionate communication. I love it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the basis for our mediation, compassionate communication. Again. Circles, we, we, we oh, use yes. the circles. Too. Oh, yes, the circles. Best and thing in the world. That is very healing. Yes. And right now, as we engage back into community, COVID pulled us so much away from that. We are social beings, period, yes. period. And um, maybe there's a few of us that don't like <laughs> to be around people, but, but we, in general, I think the most people do in community and we need our community and we need, we need adults to be good, good role models to it, to teach the babies and teens and young adults that it's possible to have the kind of world we wish to be, have a peaceful, loving world. So yes, I, I definitely would like to talk to you more about that. Yeah, we can, we can, we can, we can certainly try to try to, uh, Okay, I'm going to make an I'm I'm going to implore my listeners out there, and this will be replayed. Please, please do check out Conflict Solutions Center, and I will have the email down below, contact information where you can get a hold of them to begin a journey, really on on communication tools. I think it's so important as we re-engage ourselves after COVID. Uh, it's a time for us to to really wake up and help our communities, help ourselves, help our families, and definitely help our children again. Um, if you uh, like this information, please subscribe to One Heart TV. And we always look for donations to keep these videos coming to you. Again, thank you both Maria and Cheryl. Really, really appreciate you taking your time today. Uh, I Thank think you. I think you just gave a little little drop of really what you do, and I would love for people to be a fly on the wall, so to speak, and watch watch what happens with you. So um, I will be pushing and nudging people. I'll be nudging people in your direction again. And also, let them know that we also do um, public presentations. So if you are in an org organization that wants a presentation on, um, dispute resolution or conflict management, we, that's part of what we do. And we've done them for teachers groups. We've done from realtors. We've been in all kinds of organizations with a one hour presentation on conflict management and conflict resolution. You know, that was the, per that's the perfect drop in because I will, I also put this on LinkedIn now and uh, the, the videos. And so what's going on here is any, what you're saying is even any business that right. wants to have an hour, an hour to build yeah. community within the business. You're going to get better benefits when you talk differently and, and know the communication tools within your own yes. business. Wow. That's a great idea. I didn't, you know, that's great. Okay. You guys, you're inspiring me. Thank you for the Thank for you. This nudge to get, to rethink things in my own self. And uh, we want to be out in the world. And the more people that know about us, the better it is for everyone. You got that love and peace to you both. And thank you, uh, thank you uh, Facebook. I know I didn't do it on YouTube, but I'm learning how to do that. So any of you caught us on Facebook, this will be replayed as well on, as on YouTube. This is One Heart TV, Jolyn talking to you. Thank you, Maria and Cheryl again. Okay. Thank, thank you for having us.
Love y'all. Bye-bye. Bye.